uh, this lesson, I just love this lesson. I hope you get a kick out of it because it is pretty cool. If you're artistically inclined, this will definitely be a time for you to... Uh, where is it? Oh, I don't know what that question is. Okay, so here we go. Okay, now, first of all, by way of introduction of 3D graphing in higher math, when you graph in three space, there's actually two methods. Most people use the right-hand method. Um, you would say, if you wanted to show in three dimensions, you would say the x-axis is coming out at you, the y-axis goes horizontally, crazy, and z-axis goes up. And so if you were to graph a point in three space, it's not an order of pair anymore, it's an order of triple. For example, if I graph the space, the point two, one, three, that would be the order of triple two or three. Now the problem is, it's hard to figure out exactly where that is. I mean, that could be looked at so many ways. Besides two, one, three, it could be, you know, just up uh, one, one, or something like that. It's hard to look at that point, right? So usually when you graph points in three space, you box it to show that it, it is there. Okay, and that's the order of triple two, one, three. Now, uh, instead of quadrants, there are <laughs> octants. There are octants. Okay. Okay. So think about this. Here's space. If I use one line to cut it in two, then how many spaces are made? Two. If I use two lines to cut it, then I get four. If I use three lines to cut it, then I get eight spaces. What if I use four dimensions? Sixteen. Okay. okay. You could say before that. What? Fifth dimension? The band? Oh, yeah. Wait, how is that even more? Uh, well, it depends on how you define the fourth dimension. If you call it time, then you'd say before. What's that? I don't know. That's why I had trouble with higher than the top. Because there's no way to get into that. Okay, now then, you're going to graph in three dimensions. So you're going to show your axes on a slant. Would you please graph your x axis and y axis now and forever on today's lesson? Or like that. I guess you could say that instead of looking at the paper head on like this, you're looking at it more like this. And if you did, instead of looking like a rectangle, it would look more like a parallelogram, right? So um, here's the thing. If I graph the square root graph, I'm going to go one, two, three, four units and two units in y, but it needs to be in a way that's parallel to the y-axis. So when I go to 4, 2, I'm going to go that way. And 1, 1 is that point. And the graph to the square root down to the x-axis would look like that. Okay? Now, that for now satisfies that question, graph the space in three space. Now, just by way of introduction of where we're headed. Okay? You, in solids with known cross-sections, are going to be doing a totally different type of volume problem. Every volume problem you've done so far is a revolution problem, where you take a space and revolve it about the axis, and no matter how you revolve a section, it makes some kind of circular picture because that distance stays the same as you revolve it. It doesn't vary. So you're always dealing with pi and cylinders and such like that, or... Yeah, um, or washers. In this case, however, it's going to be different. Think of it more like this is a plot of land off of which you will build. And when you go to build it, you're going to be stacking um, stuff off that land. So, for example, I might, I wish I had a, I might say that, 
Ah, let's go with the from me. This would have been free. I wish I would have thought of that before. Okay? So off a piece of land, I might graph or put rectangular prisms that gradually get smaller. I could do circles. Let me show you. For example, if I put all my cross sections this way, then all of the bottom edges of them would be this along this space, yeah? And if they were all squares, then they might look like square, but a little smaller square, and a little smaller square, and a little smaller square, and a little smaller square, little smaller square until they came down to a point. That would be square cross sections, parallel to the y-axis. Those would be x's. Those would be x's, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Now, I could also, instead of using squares, I could use rectangles. Um, all with. Now, in that case, my squares, the heights varied because if the base of the square is long, then the height of the square is long. But I could say just a rectangle that the height for all of them is always two units, in which case you might say this is two units, and this is two units, and this is two units, and this is two units, in which case it would always stay the same and the top would look exactly like the bottom and be more like a, a prism, like we have for many times. You with me? Okay. You could also say instead of squares, I could do triangles. Triangle cross section. Triangle cross section. You could do semicircular cross sections. Okay. You could do hexagon. We don't do hexagon. You could do hexagon. That would be really sweet. Trapezoid. Okay. You could do. Um, now, those are all cases where the slices are parallel to the y-axis, and as Pete just mentioned, uh, insightfully, that would be dx. If, however, I made the same space and made my slices this way, then I used semicircles. Then they would be totally different. So there's all these varieties. Cross sections parallel to the x-axis, parallel to the y-axis. Semicircles, triangles, squares, rectangles. Everyone has different volumes, and they all could be used in a lot of ways to model things in real life. Now, there's there are real life applications to this. Um, for one, I don't know, we don't have a 3D printer at this school, but when you when a 3D printer makes a copy of a figure, whatever that's supposed to be a vase. Are you with me? Okay, then it takes measurements at, it sets it, basically you think of it as like Z level or height level zero. And it measures the distance to points from lots of directions. And it has basically a feel for the cross section at that point, what the shape is. And it constructs out of plastic or some kind of material, a cross section that matches it. Then it goes up a level and it, at this level, measures how far or the shape of that cross section, and it builds cross sections until it hopefully makes a copy. And so, this stacked cross sections is very much the idea behind a 3D printer. So, also, I can tell you when you, uh, if you were to model or map a lake, you could take measurements across the lake. And then say, based on the shape of the lake, they might be usually semicircles are modeled, they assume, making the assumption that it's deeper towards the middle, which is a huge assumption. But um, for rivers, it's a pretty safe assumption. But you use the same cross-sectional sum kind of difference. Now, these are the kind of things that applied mathematicians might do. They use math to model build up. Okay? So here we go. Uh, let's. The question then of the day will not be, hey, draw a pretty picture. It will be, find the volume of that. Now, that's, that's where the calculus comes in. No, it's like cake plus frosting. It's good and better. Okay? It's drawing plus math. You're welcome. All right? So here we go. Um, what? No way. All right. So 
Let's try that same region now, uh, which is the square root region to 4. Cross sections parallel to the y axis, we're going to find the volume. So they're parallel to the y axis. You should draw the region with perspective at an angle. Okay, you draw slices based on the question parallel to the y-axis, parallel to the x-axis, perpendicular to the x-axis, perpendicular to the y-axis, read carefully, obviously perpendicular to the x-axis is the same as parallel to the y-axis. They will sometimes say it one way or the other, but it means the same, right? Okay, so um, after that, you try and draw at least one 3D uh, prism that you're trying to graph. Now, if you want to draw the whole, it looks really cool. But really, the star of the show is to say, what would one cross-section look like? Uh, if this is going to be the bottom edge of a square, then when I pop out of this plane, the distance I go up should be the same as the distance of that slice. Same goes on this side. And so all four of those edges should be the same. Now that's one. If you would like to then draw more cool, they come down to a point. And so if you were to connect, the front vertex of the squares would all be connected, forming a ridge, and the back would also form a ridge. Follow? Okay. Now then, the volume is where the calculus instruction comes in. Volume equals of one slice. These are always going to be prisms, so the volume will be area of the base times the height. When you go to find the volume of one, it helps me to have a picture located. Now the height is really the thickness. I know, don't, I, at this point, I, you know that height doesn't necessarily go up that ridiculous. Height is more like what's the distance between the two bases. Let me say that again. Sorry, 30-second pre-algebra lesson. I cannot get this to my pre-algebra kids' heads to save my life. What's the base? The bottom rectangle or the front triangle? Right, triangle. The triangle, okay. The base is what has a perfect copy. The whole formula is predicated on area of the base being how many blocks could I build on this level times how many levels to get the total volume, right? Um, so the base is the what has a perfect copy. In this case, it's the square has a perfect copy. This is the area of the base. The height is super thin. And so the height is always going to be dx or dy, depending on uh, the cross sections parallel or perpendicular to whatever. Okay? The area of the base uh, depends on the geometric figure. given in the problem. They said we're using square cross-sections here. So the area of the base is a side square. Now then, that's where we start to get into familiar territory calculus ones. Here's the sides of the square. They're varying. It's a vertical distance, upper minus lower. So what would you call the side? The square root, it's the curve, right? So in this case, the square root curve. So the volume then of all of those slices, there are, I mean, there are tons of slices. I'm actually doing an infinite, infinite sum of all these slices here and adding them. That's where the calculus operation of an integral comes in to sum the many products. Um, of the square root of x squared, the height is dx, volume is area of the base, times the height, and the limits of integration are tied to the variable you use, in this case, 0 to 4. Okay, that's easy enough to find. What's the antiderivative? 
point one half x squared. It's the antiderivative of x itself. So, although it's a really complicated problem, complicated drawing, the volume is straight up just <sighs> So, good question. First of all, I would beg you to notice what's not there. No pi. Now, why is there no pi here? Because I can guarantee you, the first time this is on a test, people are going to say, uh, shouldn't there be a pi in there? I'll throw a pi in there. You have no mathematical reason for putting a pi in there, but you feel like if it's a volume, it should have a pi in there, so I'm throwing it in there. Forget it. Okay? Pi and revolutions, pi comes from the fact that if you take this region and revolve it, what's created is many cylinders. And there has to, because that's always going to involve an equidistant being revolved up and out, it's always going to involve a circular section because that distance stays the same all the way throughout. That's why always pi here and r, pi r squared or pi r squared minus r squared here and so on. Uh, but here, there's no revolution component to this. It's just a flat piece of paper off of which you're building stuff, so there's no, there's no revolving. Okay. okay. So, um, this is kind of what I walked through there. I just gave you the steps. I'm not sure uh, if those are really necessary, then I think we kind of did those as we went. So, let's go to this one, okay? So, s imagine if you had a little more complicated region. Let's draw the first quadrant at an angle. F of x is just f of x equals x, so it's going to go up 1 over 1, up 2 over 2, so here's f. Cool. g of x has a y-intercept of 4. This is the y-axis, by the way, this sort. A y-intercept of 4, and goes down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1, so it would look more like this. Now, I'm only using the y-axis, so I'm not going to keep going, but this is g of x, negative x plus 4. You follow? Okay. Instead, use the y-axis, so I'm looking at that, that triangular region that abuts the y-axis. Are we cool? Okay. Reading on, then, now we're going to what I think of as striping. We're striping it with... Rectangular cross sections parallel to the y axis. So here's the y axis, obviously. If I go parallel to the y axis, then the stripes would go that way. And in this case, I'm doing rectangular cross sections, height half the base. So at this first slice at the y axis, the base of the rectangle is 4, so the height would be. Two. The next one, it's a little less, so half of the height would also be a little less, and a little less, and a little less, until it goes down to a point. So this wedge shape. Do you agree with the cross section? Okay. Now then, getting into one. That's what 1 looks like. The thickness, dx or dy, dx. Do the geometry first here. Um, in other words, don't get in a rush to bring f and g. That usually leads to more confusion. Go slowly with the geometry. Here's what I mean. If you just listen to this, you'll be so much better off. Okay. So this is the base, and the height is half the base. The area, then is base times one-half base, or one-half base squared. Now, once you have a really clean geometry idea, then bring in the functions. The volume of area of the base times the height will be one-half base squared dx. Now go to the integral. The one-half you can bring out front, and the base of each rectangle I'll need to find square it and multiply by the x. Now let's get into the base. The base of these rectangles is the part that's in the plane of the graphs. How do you find that base? Yes? Can you explain the thing about 
Sure. Uh, from the question itself, they said the height in this case is exactly half the base, as opposed to the square before, the height was equal to, in this case, the height is half. So it came from the question. Okay? All right. So in terms of the base, feel free to use F and G's names. What, what do we got? F minus G or G minus F? What's the upper is? G. So G minus F. Now, say you had made a mistake and did F minus G. What did it have cost you? Actually, let me say uh, two things. What did it have cost you in terms of the answer? Why not? Because the square, if you did F minus G, it would have been negative, but the square would have covered you both, right? Now, what did it have cost you points-wise on my test? You better believe it. You did bad math, and I definitely take off for bad Okay? Uh, well, limits of integration, just by maybe guess and check. What are they? Zero to... Yeah, it's two. They mean it two. Okay. Are you with me? All right. Now this one's this one's harder than this one. I'm not going to lie, but I want you to try it, get into it, and think about it. Um, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Try this one on your own or with your math amigos, please. It's the same region, by the way. It's just a different volume situation. Oh, thanks, Cole. Okay, um, so do you agree they're perpendicular to the y-axis is, I guess, the same as parallel to the x-axis, yeah? So your slices are different this time. That's why we're going to be doing dy. Um, also notice that the cross-sections all have height 2, not 2 times the base, just 2, every time 2. So here... Two units up. Here, two units up. Everywhere, exactly two units up. So what would the top of the surface look like? Will it be curving or will it just be a mirror image of the base? Mirror image of the base. So it looks more like uh, this. Right? I didn't do that very well, but you get it? Cheese, did you say? Yeah. Sure like yeah. Now that's actually, it's funny you say that because Jackie Diaz, do you know, do you know Jackie Diaz? Yeah. She uh, actually brought in a whole bunch of cheese and we did this with cheese. We cut cheese to make uh, faces and stuff. It was so cool. It was like, oh, cheese. Uh, we could have done this with We could. Uh, why does it really stand up well? Maybe a dense cake. Maybe. Like a pound. Okay. Or just a bad made bread. What? Cookie dough. Cookie dough, yeah. That would be fun. Actually, I used to do this with Play Doh, but it was too hard to get the kids to focus on the calculus. <laughs> Play Doh. Um, so, anyway. so, anyway, um, the slices look like this. Um, this thickness is dy, as you said. But because it's two different uh, curves as a right end, we're going to need two integrals, red and green. Okay, so we we'll need two. Um, this, this base, geometrically, I'm just going to leave it base. It is what it is. This height, though, is always two. So the volume of these is always going to be um, two times a base times a dy. Cool? All right. And I'm going to now need two of these, so 2 base dy for the first section plus 2 base dy for the next. You could obviously take a big 2 out and pull it all the way out front. That's fine, too. The first base, here are the red bases. It's varying, right minus left, the right being the line, the left being the axis, 0. So what is base 1? Just f of x, but in what terms? y terms. So if you take y equal x and put it in y terms, it's just y. Not y squared, just y. Okay? In the next term, the green, now we hand off into g of x. g of x, or if you like, equals y equals negative x plus 4 in y terms is negative y plus 4. The limits of integration on section red, what are they? 
Zero to two and in the green section. Two to four. Easily integrates and so on. Okay? You got it? Okay, let's move on. Um, I probably won't do this one. It's, uh, we'll do it when it comes up on the home one, but for now, let's just focus on equilateral. Okay, so um, if you would, half the regions on a slant or a two dimensional region, a parabola would look something like this. A negative x plus 2 would have a y intercept of 2 and go down like that. I'm only going to graph the piece that intersects the region. Oh, yeah, is it almost 10? Maybe I should. Uh, all right, let's, well, I'll just keep going. Slices parallel to the y axis, back to parallel to the y axis, so they go here. Okay, very cool. Um, now, equilateral triangles go like this. I don't do a very good job. I'm not sure where to put the ridge, but the ridge feels like it. Go like that. That looks like a cheese wedge to me. Okay? It's 10 if you're going to walk out. Good morning. That one student actually got out. Pardon the interruption. Today, March 14, 2018, we're running out of Sorry. Uh, we actually, to find the area of the base for a triangle, we actually have three different approaches. I don't know if you remember, but there are three ways to find area of the triangle. What's one? Base times height divided by two. Now, surely that's the most common one. What else? Okay, there's one you did in pre calc. Remember? Yeah, one half a b sine c, and then there's also Heron's formula, which usually only math and that one. But uh, based on the semi-perimeter and all this stuff. So uh, now for this, for these problems, this is by far the easiest to use. So let, let me explain why. Because it's equilateral. If it's an equilateral triangle, what does that imply about A and B, the sides? A and B must be equal. If it's an equilateral triangle, A and B, the two of the sides, must be the same. So that means I could say area is one half A squared sine C, and that's pretty clean. Also, because it's an equilateral triangle, that implies angle C is 60 degrees. And so area is 1 half A squared sine of 60 degrees. What's sine of 60 degrees? No, are you kidding? <laughs> but root 3 over 2, thank you. Root 3 over 2, jeez, freaking me, you're trying to kill me. So on these problems, you'll always see root 3 over 4, a squared. Hey, phone boy. Okay, root 3 over 4, a squared. Uh, it's, it's super clean, and it doesn't involve having to find, you know, right triangle. It's, it's better than saying, oh, okay, well, let me bust out my right triangle trig to find the height, the tangent of 60, this, because it's so much easier, okay? So... Um, the volume then is root 3 over 4 times just a side squared. Now the side then, that's where we get into what is the side of each of these triangles. How would you find each of those blue segments lines? G of x minus f of x, the line minus the parabola. G of x minus f of x, the quantity squared. Uh, you might be able to just guess and check the limits. What do you reckon these are going to meet at? One, I agree with one. One equals one. Negative two? I agree, negative two. Okay, so negative two to one. Um, again, I'm going to hammer on this over and over again. couple, just don't try and memorize. The concept takes you where you want to go, but... 
do you agree that when you did washers, it looked kind of like this, but it was square minus square, or yes. whatever. This is difference squared. That obviously is not the same, so be careful not to get this confused with washers, or more importantly, start to do washers wrong because now you think it's the difference all squared. Remember, washers are still square, r squared minus r squared, right? I said it again. I said it once, but I'll say it again. There is no pi. Okay? There is no reason to have a pi up front. There's not a revolution. Please don't force a pi in there. There's no pi. All right. That one's good. Moving on to the next case or the last case here. Imagine. Imagine if you did, if you could, semicircles. Let's go with the sine curve. We're only going to do the sine curve up to pi over 2. We're not going to take it down back to the, so just that part of the sine curve and the x-axis, cool? Now, these are semicircular cross sections. We'll come back to that parallel to the y-axis. That's the part you want to go to next. Show your orientation of your cross sections. Go parallel to the y-axis. And now the cross sections are semicircular. So. Want to poke it up, kind of thing. Yeah. Now this, uh, the first three years I taught this, the results were first time on the test, usually about forty percent success. But after I started teaching it, uh, as I'm about to teach it, the success rate is more like eighty nine percent. Okay. So it goes to this. Um, we're trying to find the volume of that, and it's a prism with a dx height. That's all easy enough. And the area of the base, formula is clean. Geometrically, it is 1 half pi r squared, all right? Now, the problem then came from r not really being <coughs> evident in the picture. r is here. So people would then say, OK, well, I'll find the total distance and half it, but then they forgot the half. or didn't square the half, which they should have. It was a mess, all right? So let's consider it this way. Wouldn't you say that diameter is easier to find? Yes. Okay. Now, because it's easier to find, if I did this in terms of the diameter, then instead of r squared, I'm going to use d over 2 squared. Now, with cleanup, then, that makes it clearer than that half gets squared. And so if you combine all together, then it would amount to a constant out front of pi over 8 of the diameter squared or the area of the base times the height d, x or dy. Okay? So pi over 8, you're always going to see that. That's not just this problem. All problems that involve a semicircle, you'll have this pi over 8 going on. If you approach it that way, then you can set up the integral a lot easier than trying to say, all right, half the distance, blah, blah, blah. Um, so what is the diameter? Just sine in this case. It's not uh, two curves or anything like that. It's just sine minus zero, if you like, but sine. Uh, limit zero to pi over two or zero to one? Zero to pi over two. Do that. All right. Try the last one on your own. It's the hardest of the bunch. If you can do that one, then you are in very good shape. Okay.
He actually was. He was. Would you please put in your calculator? Just the uh, easiest to check and answer if you just have a numerical answer. Okay, about ready? All right, I would imagine one of two answers, 0.183 or 0.448. Sounds, it looks like some of you are still plugged in, so I'll give you the one more minute to finish. So what do you think? 0 0.183 or 0 0.448 or something else altogether? It is 0.448. Okay. Now, the the greatest mistake that people would make is identifying the diameter. Can you just for the diameter do arc sine? Would would make sense, but that's not it. This this distance here is the distance to arc sine. That's what you're finding. This distance would be total distance of pi over 8 to take away that chunk. So the diameter is actually pi over 8 minus arc sine. Right? Minus left. Pi over 2. Sorry. Pi over 2 minus arc sine of y is the diameter. Not pi over 8. Sorry. So the volume is pi over 8 out front for one half and half the diameter squared, um, pi over two minus arc sine of y quantity squared from zero to pi over two or zero to one? Zero to one. That's it. Okay. The good news is that I want to go over that homework from last night as well. So I'm not going to collect it today. If you're a lazy weasel who didn't do it, but you did do it, then I guess you're in luck. I will take it tomorrow. We'll go over it. Tomorrow's next practice day, no lesson. So we'll go over it thoroughly tomorrow. Uh, actually, no, I put them in the class, so I will find them. We're going to go over that legal worksheet tomorrow. Hang on to it. And have two homeworks for me tomorrow, 97 and... Okay, I need to pause. Bye, math people. People.